to doorway to self we welcome you back to our series on sindhi history and sindhi culture as we continue to explore the various aspects of our culture that we have been divorced from and don't know about it is wonderful to have parveen talpur with us today thank you and we welcome you all to this glimpse that will help you uh, perhaps explore more into sin sin's history and culture i now invite amrita sadarangani to please continue thank you very much it is a pleasure to be able to moderate this conversation and to speak um with all of you here today um i am executive director to the gujarat biotechnology university project a novel higher education partnership between the world leading university of edinburgh and the gujarat government to create a new institution placing innovation and excellence at its core to deliver biotechnology solutions to society's needs i led the university of edinburgh south asia regional center from 2010 to 20 and i'm interested in the transformational power of and the future of higher education and um today we are in conversation with the fascinating author archaeologist and historian parveen talpur Her career in archaeology and writing began simultaneously when she tailored her master's term papers on archaeology into journalistic articles and published them in the leading newspapers. From 1991 to 97, she was a visiting scholar at Cornell University, New York, where she conducted her research on the Indus Valley seals, beginning with designs on the button seals, which until then were ignored as votive symbols. The results of her research were first published in the Wisconsin Archaeological Reports and in 1995 Sindh University published her book Geometry on Indus Signs and Symbols. Currently Parveen is focused on the socio-cultural context content in seal iconography and she is seeking clues in folklore ancient Sindhi words Karoshti of Ashoka's rock edicts Buddhist mandalas and Pali of original the the script scriptures she explains her findings in her book indus seals beyond geometry a new approach to break an old code published in 2017 parveen has taught at cornell university in new york elmira college new york sindh university jamshoro and binghamton university new york parveen has also scripted a documentary heritage on the preservation of old buildings of hyderabad and is the great great granddaughter of Mir Sher Muhammad Talpur popularly known as the lion of sin currently parveen is working on the second and revised edition of talpur rule in sin her first book published in 2002 to set the context for today i'd like to quote from gopal krishna gandhi our country is named after the river sindhu the greeks and later the romans called it indus this is how a class in geography began and ended little did i know that the indus and the land to which it gave its name is home to generations to me two generations ago and would fascinate me and so many of us all over the world sindhi or not understanding sindh its civilizations their evolution the overlapping cultures the ideo- ideologies and syncretism is so very important not only for sindhis but for all of us uh with that may i invite um your thoughts parveen on uh to set the scene for us the time period and context for the story of the talpurs and why it is so important to the understanding of sindh thank you miss madanani and miss sadarangani for inviting me yes i will be very happy to talk about the talpurs and beginning you know like uh, how to place their that period was very interesting uh, when talpurs came to power 
and when uh, they fell from the power, 1783 to 1843. So it was, you know, like Sindh was a kingdom just next to Punjab, which was a Sikh kingdom. Maharaja Ranjit Singh for most of that part had been, you know, contemporaneous with the Talpurs. And also there was uh, Afghanistan. So the previous ruling dynasty of the Kaloras, they had uh, already, they have been like paying tribute, annual tribute to Afghanistan. Talpurs continued with it for some time. And then obviously there were troubles in Afghanistan. This is very important to understand that, you know, uh, how Sindh is so important during that period. So when the trouble started in Afghanistan and Shah Shuja al was overthrown, so the whole situation changed. But they were also like the powers, the, uh, the Western powers were also getting interested in Sindh because uh, South India was already, you know, like there was the French connection. And then because of the Napoleonic threat that he and the Alexander uh, and sorry, the Tsar of Russia, uh, they had, you know, planned through certain treaty that how they will be, you know, making further conquests. And Sindh was on the agenda and there was a Napoleon's threat to Sindh. So that is why the British got interested into Sindh. Now, Sindh had been living in splendid isolation since centuries, you know, at the most, you know, it was the Afghan invasions uh, or Afghan threats, I would say, not actual invasions. Uh, that, that is only relevant. But other than that, you know, the Western powers were away. So Talpurs came at a power when the Western world was getting interested into Sindh. So that's very most interesting to note. And then the most uh, important event that happened and that eventually brought the downfall of the Talpurs was the first Anglo-Afghan war, which of course resulted in a disaster for the British empire. But as a result, when the Britishers came back uh, defeated from Afghanistan, then Punjab and Sindh, they were both colonized. So that is briefly, you know, just to give you a context that what was the time period that the Talpurs came in. Thank you for that. That's a fascinating start to our conversation today. Mm -hmm. I find the story of the Talpur so very interesting because of the dynamics between the four brothers and the three branches and how they worked together. Can you tell us a little bit about how this power structure uh, benefited Sindh and its people at the time and a little more of the story between all of these? Yeah. I think the first thing that is going to strike anybody is the most unique feature of this power structure. Because we always hear, especially, you know, in the subcontinent, you know, the war of successions, as soon as the ruling authority is going to die or is dead, you know, between the brothers. But here in Sindh, it was just opposite. When Mir Fateh Ali Khan Talpur, who was the main leader in the war against uh, the, the Kaloras, when, when he actually invited his brothers, the three of his other brothers, that they should rule jointly. Talpurs had been a very, like a tribal society, but they were like, uh, uh, they held very high positions, military and administrative positions uh, in, in the Kalora court. So, Mir Fateh Ali invited his three brothers to come and have like a joint. They did not sit on the throne, what they call Masnad. They would sit on both of his sides, the, the three other brothers, and they ruled it together. And not only that, there were other cousins and so many other Baloch um, uh, tribals who had been, you know, with the Talpurs. So they gifted, you know, uh, whatever anybody deserved. So they gave one part that is of Mirpur Khas to one, to one of the cousins and another Khairpur to another cousin, you know. So in that way, you know, there were like four brothers ruling at Hyderabad court, but then Sindh itself was divided between three main parts and the Hyderabad Talpurs are known as Shahdadani Talpurs named after Mir Shahdad Khan Talpur. And we, Mirpur Khas Talpurs, I'm from the Mirpur Khas Talpurs, we are known as Markanis, 
which is uh, the original two brothers, son of uh, Suleiman Khan Talpur. Uh, these two brothers had migrated to Sindhwata Khan and Manik Khan. So we named ourselves the Mankani Talpurs and then the Sorabani Talpurs of uh, Kherpur. So it was a very harmonious uh, way of ruling, you know. There had been one war earlier in earlier times, but that was it, you know. It was not much, much of a significance. Yeah. That is, you know, really wonderful to hear that uh, in a time where um, sort of warring between families was the norm, uh, there was this very harmonious way of working together. Um, how did that sort of evolve into, um, you know, the what the rulers did, what the mirrors did uh, in terms of, uh, you know, establishing infrastructure, um, you know, focusing on the people and their needs? Could you tell us a little bit about what they built? and how they ruled. On their call, these Baloch Sardars, they would collect their own men and they would reach the capital. This is how it, the, the system was. And then all these Baloch Sardars, they were given Jagir. So what is now known as the Jagir Dari systems, you know, big chunks of land. And they gave it through Sanad. So uh, annually, you know, they will come and renew it. And sometimes not even annually, but whenever one Sardar died, then obviously the descendants, the son or whoever, would take the Sanat to get it renewed from the Talpurs so that they can continue. So these were like hereditary Jagirs in which these strong Baloch Sardars, they ruled their own tribes. And Baloch, as you know, were a tribal society. So they are like many different tribes. And then they were like all over Sindh. And this is how they were ruled. Uh, there was also a judicial system, you know, like the administrators, I forgot the word, like what they were called. Uh, so there were administrative administrators, there were divisions of, um, uh, you know, in the like of provinces, I don't know how many they were. Uh, but the, for instance, in the judicial system, they were quite just, they held the capital punishment only the Talpurs were allowed, they themselves allowed to give the capital punishment if it was wanted. They did have otherwise the judicial system, the Qazis or the judges, they continued with that, you know. Uh, education was also, you know, there, but it was a traditional education, not much about technology and science. It was more of uh, literature, Quranic studies, Arabic, Persian languages. Uh, and philosophy, obviously. Uh, so those were the things that were taught, you know. Thank you. There's, there's, uh, you've shared some wonderful images of the courts or the forts that were built, mm -hmm. uh, you know, around yeah. that time. Could you tell us a little bit about those structures? Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, I had often been asked this question, even much before I wrote the book on Talpurs, that where are the Talpurs palaces? Uh, and why Talpurs did not build anything. I think because it was a short rule. Secondly, because it was a tribal society, they didn't care much about, you know, decor and uh, monumental buildings. And also because maybe the history of Sindh had been so that even in Mohenjo-Daro 5,000 years ago, if you compare it with Egyptian and Mesopotamian civilizations, we do not have any monumental architecture in that also. But one of the things that Talpurs did do was, you know, the building of the forts, uh, especially around their boundaries. Uh, that was obviously to make their kingdom uh, secure uh, from, the, from the outsiders. For instance, you know, in the desert, or let's start from desert in the east, Umarkot was there. Umarkot was uh, built not by the Talpurs, but by some Maharaja of uh, Umarkot, whoever he was, you know. And that is why some people even, uh, you know, dispute the name that it was Amarkot, uh, not Umarkot. But the common belief is that, you know, maybe it was built by the Sumra kings, uh, Umar Sumra, uh, that he built it. So Talpurs built two more forts, uh, you know, in the desert to make the make the defense even more stronger. And one was known as Islam court, and the other one is known as Nau court, which, you know, means, you know, uh, in contrast to the old fort, which is uh, Omar court. 
Okay. And then there was a fort at the island of Manora also, where British later on built their lighthouse. There was a fort in Kherpur, which is still there and very impressive, Court Digi Fort. And then there is Running Court. People compare it with the China Wall. It's like miles long wall. It's uh, in the vicinity of Amri and Jamshoro and towards that side. So these are the buildings that were built. Uh, but in fact, you know, like uh, the, the Talpur's residences, they too had very high walls. And the residences of Talpurs were called uh, court, like court of Mir so and so. So the Talpurs residences are also called court, and court is the Sindhi word for a fort. They had been good at building forts. You talked earlier about the British and how you know they um, found Sindh very interesting, though it was left alone for a long time. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the story of? Uh, the British engagement with Sindh and how they transi transitioned into taking power, but also the relationship between the British and the Talpurs in particular. Yeah. Yes, so Sindh, as I said, had been living in isolation and they were, they were guarding uh, River Indus very jealously. Uh, Indus was considered to be actually the property of the Talpurs, even if they had given Jagis to their Badu Sardars, Indus was like not divided, you know. So the part of Indus, which is in Sindh, was like a, a very uh, precious commodity for the Talpurs. Uh, the first British resident, Nathan Crow, he came during the Talpur, uh, during the rule of the first uh, uh, first Talpur, I will call it Choyari. Choyari means the rule of the four or the four friends, Char Yar, they call it. So the first one was Mir Fateh Ali Khan Talpur, who had, you know, conquered sin from uh, from the Kalhoras. So during Fateh Ali Khan's rule, uh, Nathan Crow was there as a British resident. Uh, he didn't do much. He had uh, bungalows, um, and you know. But not not much interaction, but he did write his account, which is good. And then suddenly, you know, like he was, uh, um, for some reasons, uh, Talpurs uh, told him that, you know, we cannot have you anymore. So the treaty was disrupted, whatever was written between the British that we'll have a British resident, he'll go. But by that time, you know, Nathan Crow came at a time when there was a threat from the French, from Napoleon. Uh, but once when, when Napoleon died and was defeated and everything was over, the war between Britain and France and Europe, then the, the, the whole French threat had receded. So even British lost interest in Sindh temporarily. But later on, when it was Russia who came as far as Central Asia and Talpurs knew, they realized that from Central Asia, they will be coming towards Afghanistan, the Russians. And maybe because Afghanistan is landlocked, maybe then they can enter Sindh because of River Indus, so that that, that trade can go, you know, uh, towards the sea, towards the Arabian Sea. So when this Russian threat came, then once again, British became very much interested uh, in, um, you know, having some kind of a relations uh, with with them. I think it was Lord Ellenborough who was the first one to think about actually conquering Indus River. We get hints from his correspondence that he did with the um, with the Viceroy or Governor General who was whoever was in Calcutta or in Bombay, you know. So so we hear about uh, their interest through this correspondence. And finally a plan was hatched that River Indus uh, should be surveyed. Uh, we should know, like, you know, the strategic points, uh, and uh, we should know, like, how feasible it is. So the plan was uh, uh, that uh, somebody, some British agent, uh, has to, and he has to be a very smart person to deal with the Talpurs, uh, that he should sail through the Indus and make a report on Indus. So it was Alexander Burns who was appointed by John Malcolm, who was the governor of Bombay. He was a quartermaster originally, but he had made good reports on Kutch 
and he had actually witnessed the Indus changing its course in that um, area. So he was chosen that he can be a good person uh, and he is a good negotiator. So, and the excuse to sail through Sindh was uh, that the King of England is sending uh, five or six gray horses as a gift to Maharaja Ranjit Singh of Punjab. And the nature of the gift was such that the horses could not be, you know, taken through the road. It will be too tedious. So we should take them through the, through the river. So when Alexander Burns uh, uh, reached somewhere near Karachi uh, on the Arabian Sea coast, uh, he informed the Talpurs that, you know, he is here and he wants the permission. And finally, uh, by that time, it was uh, Mir Murad Ali Khan Talpur, who was the last of the four brothers. His son, Mir Nasir Khan Talpur, who later on became the last ruler of Sindh and who was exiled by the British to Calcutta. He was a young man at that time. Uh, he met Alexander Burns and he convinced his father uh, that, you know, we should have good relations with, with the Brits. So Alexander Burns, surprisingly, he was invited to the court of Sindh. And in fact, Mir Murad Ali Talpur gave his uh, own personal boat, which were called Jumtis, you know, these uh, flat bottom boat, but it was like, uh, although Mir Murad Ali described it very humbly that, you know, you can go in my boat, but when Alexander Burns saw the boat, it was like <laughs> luxuriously, you know, with pavilions and velvets and everything, you know, and uh, couches in it. So he traveled and he symbolically, he, you know, he unfurled the British flag on that, you know. But he traveled and then, you know, I don't even have to say much because people who are interested can read the travelogue, whatever he has written. He has written three volumes on his travels and one part is on Indus River. And then he reaches there to Maharaja Ranjit Singh and he sends his report. That is how it all started. But I must say, because you said that, you know, about the British, I, there were many who came, Henry Pottinger, who was resident of Kutch, because British had come as far as Kutch. And Kutch, by the way, is the bordering, uh, is the, you know, Sindh. It's just a next door neighbor. So British had already reached there. So Henry Pottinger had also visited the court of Sindh. And he had written his account, personal views, you know, Pottinger's account, and sorry, and also Boston, that is another one. The Boston has written the personal views on Sindh. Uh, and after that, uh, it was during, um, I think when Mir Muradali, the last brother was the heir apparent, they invited an English doctor from Kutch. That was Dr. James Burns. He was actually brother of Alexander Burns, who later comes with the horses. So James Burns had already visited the court of the Talpurs, and he also has written uh, his account and a very interesting account, you know, very historical. For instance, you know, malaria was like a big thing uh, during big issue dur during those days and quinine was discovered. So he bought some quinine also and he had cured, you know, some people and Talpurs really thought that it is kind of a magic potion. So he lit they literally, uh, you know, uh, got hold of it and they did, did not even give it back to him and until he himself got malaria. So they gave it to him so that he could be cured, you know. So these kind of a things, and also he gives a very good description uh, about, you know, some of the social setup and the Indus from, you know, uh, Indus from the other side, from the Kutch side that he had come. So during the, the, the rule of the Choyari, these four brothers, this is, you know, as far as the British got into contact, you know, and it was after them, after Mir Murad Ali died and his son Mir Nur Muhammad and Mir Nasir Khan, came. And by that time, you know, already there was, you know, the battle was brewing next door in Afghanistan, like how to place Shah Shuja, who was actually living in Shikarpur for so many years. Later on, he became, you know, uh, he, uh, British gave him protection, but they wanted to restore him in Afghanistan. So because things were happening there, 
So then, you know, the tempo is building and more and more British are coming and all that, you know, the army. So the beginning was made by Alexander Burns, but behind him was this whole Indus army, what they call, which went into Afghanistan, was about to enter Sindh. Yeah. That, that is so interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, oral history and the oral history of Sindh and how it connects all of these dots? Nowadays, oral history is becoming very popular and uh, it is being considered as a part of history. First, it was just, you know, that these are the tales that people are saying. But obviously, you know, you have to take it with a pinch of salt uh, because uh, there is no way to authenticate. But surprisingly, sometimes it can be authenticated also, you know. I belong to, the, you know, after the fall of the Talpurs, after Mir Shir Muhammad Khan Talpur, like I am the fifth generation uh, of uh, the direct descendants coming from Mir Shir Muhammad Khan Talpur. So in a way, I find myself that, you know, uh, I am lucky because uh, I know uh, the previous generation, my parents' generation, which was the fourth generation. I also happen to know my grandmother, my uh, grandfather, he died very young. Uh, that is another story I will tell you. Uh, so to my grand grandmother's generation, which is which makes it the third generation. And uh, my grandfather was the grandson of Mishir Muhammad Talpur. So at least I can go so far back to the oral history that I heard as a, you know, as a child growing up in my village. So the oral history, you know, like uh, uh, most interesting were the stories that uh, I overheard uh, and I still remember. Uh, they came from the women who were like around my grandmother, you know, and they were the women, you know, uh, Obviously, birth dates were not written, so they would establish their age through events. And then one of the great events in Sindh that changed literally the whole landscape of Sindh was the irrigation system that British had, you know, introduced into Sindh. And the main canal was known as the Jamrao Canal, which brought water from Indus to lower Sindh to our part, you know. So before that, obviously, irrigation system was very different. It was through Persian wheels, and the local bird was the hurlas. You know, the hurlas, they uh, took the water, uh, the, um, and that is how the land was irrigated. So when a woman would say that, you know, like how old she is, and then they would say that, okay, well, she was actually, you know, born before the Jamrao Canal. <laughs> so, you know, they, this is how they established their ages. Or, you know, like if there is, uh, that somebody was born during that period when there was famine in the Thar, and then a lot of people from Thar would migrate to Sindh, you know, because there's famine, nothing grows over there, so they come here, you know. And most interesting now that I'm finding is uh, that they would, you know, uh, speak of, uh, uh, of a, not a plague, but some pandemic, which they called loose. That what is loose that so many people died in loose, loose GV Mari that came as far as Tando Alhayar, which is close to Mirpur Khas and our village. And a lot of people died, families died. So that was like a big story. And that was now I have connected it and did my research that yes, that was really true. And that is the Spanish flu of the first world war that followed, you know, 1918 Spanish flu. But somehow the word flu Maybe it got distorted into Sindh and they started calling it loose instead of flu, you know. And of course, you know, then Mir Imam Baksh Talpur, who was like my father's grandfather and son of Mir Sher Muhammad Talpur, he was very fond of horses, that there was a certain horse whose name was Kabutar and that was gifted to the queen. So that has never been authenticated. I did a research and the name of that horse was Kabutar. 
So that was one of the stories that, you know, I, I still remember. And I also remember an old man who was blamed for the death of that horse, you know. So there are contradictions, you know, that that horse was sent to Queen Victoria, but no, that horse actually died. And why did he die? Because he took him on a long journey and there was no water and he did not, you know, feed his, the horse properly and the horse died, you know. So, you know. Uh, the oral history is not only about, uh, you know, human beings, but sometimes, you know, the animals also, you know, play their role in that history. Uh, yes, and then another incident that even my mother spoke about this, that the times when Mahatma Gandhi came to Mirpur House and the whole our village, all the men folk have left for Mirpur House to attend his speech. So the women, had their day in the village, you know, the men had all gone. So that was another thing that, you know, comes through oral history to me. And there are lots and lots, but, you know, I don't want to put too much of time there. Just one thing that, you know, I would say that, the, that one of the things that I had been able to authenticate was that my aunt would always praise the Talpur women. The Talpur women had been very brave. Even when, the, when their meals were exiled, they wrote a letter of protest to Queen Victoria. She would always speak about that. And we were kids, you know, I didn't even, you know, pay much heed to it. But later on, when I was writing the Talpur history, I did find that letter. Yes, it was written and it was, uh, so in my book, you know, this one, I have as an appendix in my, in, as one of the appendix is actually their letter. Uh, and it is unfortunate uh, that we don't even know the names of these. So the letters were written by these, you know, Amir Zadis or Mir Zadis, the, the women of, you know, the wife of Mir Karamali Talpur, who was the number two Talpur of the Choyari, Mir Muhammad Nasir Khan, who was the last ruler who was actually exiled, and then the Amir Zadi of uh, Mir Noor Muhammad Khan and Mir Muhammad Khan and Mir Sobdar Khan. So it's very unfortunate that even we do not know what were the names of these ladies. They were known by their husband's name, but they did write that letter. And first time that I heard is, it, actually it came to me through the oral history. So that's like very interesting, you know, to know. And some of the interesting things in my family, uh, personally, in, in my immediate family has been, you know, the pilgrimage, going to Mecca. So I have two very interesting accounts that my grandfather in 1922, he went to pilgrimage and he died on the, uh, on the way. And those were the times when they would go into kafilas, you know. So there was like about 100 people and I don't know how many horses and camels and, you know, animals to slaughter on the way and to eat and chickens and, you know, roosters and God knows how many of those went there. But it was a huge caravan that my grandfather and then my grandfather's uncle, Mir Nabibaksh Khan Talpur, who was actually son of Mir Sher Mahmud Talpur, they, with this caravan, they had gone to, to perform Hajj pilgrimage in Saudi Arabia, in Mecca, you know, uh, and in the Kaaba, which is considered by the Muslims as the house of God. So my, the reason for my grandfather had timed that because uh, he wanted to go and uh, thank, you know, uh, you know, because he was humbled that he was blessed by a son because, and my father was the only, only son. And he had just one sibling that is uh, his elder sister. She too passed away. So in order to go and, you know, to thank at the, at Kaaba, my grandfather and his uncle, Mir Nabi Bakshtalpur, they went with this caravan, but unfortunately they died on the way. So people used to talk a lot about the return of those people and how they broke this news and they all were wearing black clothes and it was almost sunset when these people arrived and they were mourning and there was people from the village they they just ran towards them that what is happening and then they were told that this news so you know this whole account and then my oral history is about mostly about how people traveled, what did they eat, what was the food they took, and what is it. 
So this was, you know, one of the men, uh, his name was Haji Harun, Haji because he had done Hajj and that also with my grandfather, who would always say that, you know, if you take me uh, to the Arabian desert, I will take you to the very spot where your grandfather is buried. You know, I don't know how he would perform that, but, you know, he had his belief in that. So pilgrimage in our family was like something that, you know, we remember through this story. And then in 1944, when my father, luckily he wrote his travelogue when he was going to the Hajj and he went on ship. And it was the time of the Second World War. There was blackout on the ship. There was no electricity. The only place where there, which was lighted up during the night, it was the electricity, electric poles near, around the Kaaba. Otherwise, you know, it was still the lantern area, uh, sorry, the lantern era that they had gone and um, people, there were no five-star hotels. So now if I compare my cousins going to Hajj and living in five-star hotels, so this is another thing that, is, that has changed drastically. So I consider it as a piece of history, you know, pilgrimage in the caravans and the ship during the Second World War. And now, you know, such luxurious trips to Saudi Arabia, you know. So oral history is just to me, uh, yes, it has its challenges in terms of authentication, as you said, but uh, I think, you know, it, they bring out such different perspectives to uh, traditional written history um, that I think we will never tire of hearing more. Um, you talked a lot about uh, women, the Talpur women, and, yeah. you know, for example, the letter they wrote. Um, mm -hmm. But can you tell us a little bit more about their role in mainstream life? And also, uh, you know, about, you have some wonderful pictures uh, in terms of, you know, jewelry and fashion and clothing, and how did they interact um, you know, in terms of their roles and all of these sort of cultural artifacts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yes, I would love to speak about the women because the Talpur women were really like um, living in Parda was not an easy thing. They did not, they had absolutely no idea about the world uh, outside. Uh, they would hear through their maids or from, from their male folk, like what is the world outside. They were allowed to step out of the house only during the weddings weddings, and the funerals. And of course, they, they had gone to pilgrimage also, you know, some of them. Uh, so they were allowed to go to pilgrimage also. Uh, one of the aunts of my of my father, which was granddaughter of Mirshir Mohammed Khan Talpur, uh, before partition, she used to, she was allowed to visit Khwaja um, of Ajmer, you know, as I said that they believe in saints. So she had great faith in uh, um, Ajmer Sharif. So she was, they would go through the railway and through the palkis. They would sit in the palkis and, you know, people would carry them to this Khwaja uh, Ajmer's uh, Darga where they would pray and then come back, you know. So Urs, which means um, the, the annual anniversary or festivities that they hold at Ajmer Sharif, she had attended it. Her name was Bhagbari. Talking about the jewelry, let's start from her, you know. Uh, in the picture, she's wearing this gold ring, uh, nose ring, uh, which is supposed to be a gift from the husband. And it symbolizes uh, uh, a married life. So you can only take off this nose ring when your husband dies. And it's quite heavy because uh, I have seen, you know, in my family and I've held in my hand and it must be quite heavy. So in order to hold that nose ring in your nose, it was like, you know, like uh, some strands of black thread, which was which would go right into your hair and you have to pin it so that it holds it and your, uh, you know, the nose holds, it doesn't damage your, uh, your nostril. So she wore it until her death. I had of course seen her personally wearing it and I have a very vague memory about all her dressing. I know that, uh, uh, that during those days, during uh, that my grandma Bhagbari's days, Women, uh, Sindhi uh, women wore the trousers, the shalwars, 
which were made of the striped shalwar. Uh, you can call it like it. It I think it is. It came from Turkey, maybe this uh, tradition. The striped trousers, but they were like balloons, you know, tight from the ankles, and then at once, you know, like they would balloon. And then, of course, another tradition was uh, that. Um, they had uh, buttons or whatever the openings of the neck of the shirt that was always on the side on the left side so this was the kind of dressing and it had the embroidery and even men wore shirt which have like you know and i have also seen this in many indian communities also you know they also have these you know shirts in hindus i'm talking specifically that they also have shirts which, you know, they tie it, maybe there were no buttons during those days. So you tie it into little bows and it's always on the side. So that was the kind of shirt that they wore. But obviously, you know, being Talpurs, they had like a lot of zari work and, you know, gold threaded and then Chinese silk, which is like a very, very light material, you know. So a lot of zari and all that thing. And that dupattas are always like embroidered dupatta with beautiful borders, you know, like embroidery borders with uh, zari threads. Dohri, which is the necklace, we call it Dohri. It is not specific to Talpurs, but all over Sindh. This is the traditional necklace and it can be, you know, it has its names according to the strands or the strings of pearls that you have. So it can be Panjisiri, which means five strings. And then you have Sat Siri, which has seven strings, which goes like little, little lower. That was the necklace jewelry. And the earrings, we called it Panra. They were like flat, you know. I, I just saw those in my childhood, my grandmothers wearing those, you know, the Panras, the gold Panras. And Vali's, of course, you know, those, um, what you are wearing, Amrita, in your, you know, we call it Vali's, you know. So they can be, you know, any size, big or small, you know. Uh, and uh, like you are wearing, I guess, the gold ones. But then also, generally speaking, even you can get these valleys in silver. But in Sindh, we have Champakali, a jewelry. I think it is so ancient, that Champakali thing, that it was not even embedded with the, with the gems, with the stones. It was just pure metal. And you just, you know, put a thread through it. You have a lot of pieces of champakalis and you just thread them and make it a necklace. So those are the kinds of things that, you know, we used to, during the engagement, like the nose ring was, uh, uh, was a symbol of wedding. But after engagement, uh, the girl gets two kinds of uh, rings from, uh, from the husband. One is called veer which is like a ring, which is spiral. Even nowadays it is in fashions, you know, it goes spiral. One is a weird and another, the name I forgot, but it is like a diamond shaped with geometrical design. Okay, so those are the two rings that you get, you know. And then of course, there are many, many other forms of jewelry with, and uh, dresses also. And uh, the younger generation, I'm glad that, you know, um, one of the one of the Talpur um, uh, girl, I'm proud to say, that she has like her own brand of tal uh, design. You know, she's a designer, Sidra Talpur, and she held her show. You know, the fashion show, and she, you know, displayed it. That was specifically, you know, inspired by the Talpur costumes and jewelry. That's uh, just one example to give you. You know, personally, I came in, in the historical account for the first time, I think I, wrote, I read in Potinger's account that he mentions the Talpur women. And how he mentions it, uh, that he meets a certain, certain man, uh, a Talpur man, uh, who is different, swarthy or handsome or some adjective he uses for him. And he says that is because the Talpurs, they also marry in the Mari tribe. Mari, Maris are also Bal Baloch, it, the name of the uh, tribe. That lot of, there have been a lot of marriages in the Mari women. So, and, and my family always says that, you know, the originally Talpurs had no beauty. The beauty came from the Mari women into the Talpurs. So, that is authenticated by Pottinger and I, I had read in his account. So this is how briefly describes them. And then also in Pottinger's account, he 
he gives a reference to the very early war, as I said, that between the Talpurs, there had been very early, you know, some misunderstanding between the Mirpur Khas Talpur, Mithara Khan Talpur, who was grandfather of Mir Sher Muhammad Talpur. And he was, uh, um, he was the ruler of Mirpur Khas, but his demands were like more than Mirpur Khas or whatever family differences. Then he, he went to war with Mir Ghulam Ali Talpur, who was number two after Mir Fateh Ali Khan from the Choyari or that, you know, four friends rule. So between Mir Ghulam Ali Talpur and between Mir Tara Khan Talpur, there was actually a battle that took place in which Tara Khan was injured badly, but he was taken back to his cousin Mir Ghulam Ali, who nursed him, literally nursed him. And when he became fine, he was sent back to Mipur Khas. After that, there was no war. So when Potenja describes this skirmish between the Talpurs, he says that a similar situation had arrived at some point. And then Potenja's words are that the women, they literally flung themselves between the swords that no, enough, you are not going to go to fight with each other. And it shows that Talpurs didn't have respect for their women's opinion. And that at least that one battle was fought by the women, by the Talpur women. So we get little, little references. And this is how we can build uh, the character of Talpur women, that what kind of character they had. Okay, now I've mentioned the specific letter that they wrote to Victoria, but there was also another letter that Talpur women had written to Mir Sher Muhammad Talpur. When Mir Nasir Khan and the Hyderabad Talpurs had surrendered, Mir Sher Muhammad had not reached there on the war. So when he heard the news that they have been defeated and he was thinking of, you know, of revolting against, against the Brits. So the Talpur women, the wives of Mir Karam Ali Talpur, especially, she was uh, the leader at that time of the women. She wrote a letter to Mir Sher Muhammad Talpur. And in that letter, the wording was that, you know, uh, even if you die, so many have died, you know, uh, so many Sikandars and Daras, you know, reference to Alexander the Great and Darius the Great, that even they had fought and they have died, but at least their name remains. So do not die as a coward. You should pick up arms against the British. So this was another letter that those Tarpur ladies had written. And again, you know, uh, this is also a Baloch tradition that, you know, you have to listen to the women. Mir Sher Muhammad Talpur, he said that, yes, I will, I will go, I, I will fight the British. And that is how the, his resistance continued for the British. And the letter was taken by Hosh Muhammad Shidi. He was an um, Abyssinian, I think, from Africa, who was employed in the Talpur army. And he had uh, become actually the general uh, of, of their army. So he went to, uh, with this letter to Mir Sher Muhammad Talpur, and that is how the whole resistance started. So this also, not only the women, but briefly to mention that there is a lot of African population even till now in Sindh. And these Africans, they were not, obviously they came as slaves, but they did not go through, you know, what we hear traditionally that how the slaves are treated. And many of these uh, African women, they were actually wet nurses in the Talpur family. And their men, they were very good chefs. Even the women were very good cooks. They were employed as cooks and they had very good, like, you know, sense of music, obviously. So they were singers and dancers and also warriors. So just to give you a sense of that, how they treated their minorities, you know. Uh, so coming back to the women, so I mentioned Potinja, I mentioned that other letter, these are the glimpses that we know. I think that should be enough for the past. And now the coming to the present women, as I mentioned that, you know, like uh, present day Talpurs in, no, let me give you, yes, I think from my mother's, until my mother's generation, when there was Parda, you know, one of my uncles, Mir Ahmad Khan Talpur, he bought a projector. And this is what, you know, 
I have never seen uh, movies because I'm on his projector because I was too young, but I have been told by my mother and by so many other women, he's still my, my cousin, Mira Ahmad Khan's uh, daughter, you know, she even tells me that she remembers a little bit of those movies. He bought the projector and then the Talpur ladies would gathered into his uh, house and they will watch the movies, the Bombay movies, you know. But still some of the Talpurs were so strict. For instance, one of my own uncles, Miri Mahabakshan Talpur, who was married to my uh, to my father's sister, you know, we have, you know, marriages within first cousins. So he was very strict on Parda and he would not allow his wife to watch those movies because there is, you know, um, men folk, Shyam and Pran and, you know, fighting over women. So he was, so, you know, Parda can be that strict also. And unfortunately in our family, in the Mirpur Hastar course, I think Parda was very strict and it lasted longer than any other Tarpur families, you know. Now the present day women, of course, now they have become the, you know, the boss of their houses. They can educate their children. They can ask their, their husbands that, you know, buy a bungalow in Karachi or in Hyderabad, wherever, where they want to, uh, you know, educate their children. Most of them are also getting into their own business. Like for uh, for instance, you know, uh, in in textile and fabrics, lot of one of my cousins, you know, uh, Mir Nabi Bakshan's daughter, she is doing her own business of clothing, beautiful designs, and uh, she holds lots of fairs and she's doing a good marketing. Um, uh, another Sam Talpur from Tando Jam who's doing like a, uh, she's trading, what is that? Applique work or really really work, you know, the really the quilt work in that designing. She's doing a good job. Um, and a lot of them are getting educated, uh, you know, going to, in, uh, you know, in the artwork, doctors, uh, lawyers, I don't know. But a lot of uh, our generation is now getting educated, you know. And as I mentioned, the, the fashion designer, you know, Sidra Talpur, because she has done this fashion show and a great service to the Talpur family, that is one way of showing what the Talpur heritage is. And I think it is the best way, the most interesting and the entertaining way of, you know, introducing it to people. Thank you very much. Uh, this was such a fascinating journey, right from uh, you know, history to um, culture to politics, um, conflict, uh, peace, and of course, um, women, jewelry, fashion. Uh, it's been incredibly enriching to understand so much more about mm -hmm. Sid and to understand, um, you know, your own stories of your family and your um, and its evolution and how it comes down to Sid today. So mm -hmm. that I would like to thank you very much. Can I also add one word about the oh, Talpur yes. men also? That oh, yes. obviously, you know, mostly they have, they are like in politics. And yes. even if they are not directly in politics, at least they are king makers. But their profession, of course, is agriculture. So there are a lot of Talpurs which are doing, you know, like a lot in the Talpur, uh, in, uh, sorry, in the agricultural fields, a lot of innovations also. And I specifically wanted to tell you that how the younger generation, both men and women, girls and boys, how this heritage is becoming even more dear to them. Even my own children, although they have been, you know, living in United States, and educated here, but they keep their heritage alive in both my son Imran and Jahan, my daughter's house. There, there are there has to be, you know, like some uh, some heritage of Talpurs. Uh, it could be books, it could be old photos, it could be an antique piece of an ordinary object, but you know, they keep it alive. And one of my cousins, me Mehrullah Khan Talpur. He even has his library and museum, whatever he finds from Talpur, he has collected there. He himself is a very good photographer, you know, so he knows how to do that. What I'm saying is that in this generation, you know, my generation and especially the younger generation, they are doing a lot to preserve it, you know. And 
very few talpurs have been also away from agriculture getting into some other fields also for instance my own family has now talpur doctors my own nephews you know he he is a doctor now there was one talpur in the 1970s an entrepreneur who got into the film business and he made sindhi films he made one urdu film uh, nawab mohammad hussain talpur he had made a film in the 1970s and then he got into film sindhi film making you know so what i'm saying is that apart from being landlords and agriculturists they are still doing a lot my own son you know and daughter both of them feel that now it is time to you know to preserve and to show and let's make a movie or a documentary you know so they they are going back to their roots uh, like sidra talpur you know these all the younger people they are going back to their roots and you know trying to preserve and you know to hold hold on to their heritage yeah so that's the only thing i wanted to mention thank you very very much it's always wonderful and very heartening to hear that um you know we are aware of our history of our heritage uh particularly for yourself and your family i hope that we will be able to see a lot more come through with their interest and the generations to come in their history and heritage and so there will be so many more stories to tell and pictures to show thank you very much for having me over it was wonderful अज उत्तर पार दे ताड़े की तवार अज उत्तर पार दे ताड़े की तवार हार न हार न हर संभारा मुझा सरिया चा संगार अज मुझे यार वसण गावे सकिया अज उत्तर पार दे ओ अजब उत्तर पार दे ककर तो कार करे अजब उत्तर पार दे ककर तो कार करे वसे तो वड पुड़ो कालक खंड भरे विजण न सान वरे मुज सकार न सुख दिए हो तो के सिंधड़ी सार तो के सिंधड़ी सारे वे